Cue the music. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of The Problem with Reading. I'm Brevin. And I'm Steven. And we, too, shall be your hosts this evening. All of our friends have abandoned us yet again. Um, I'm sensing a pattern. It's not a good one. I have examined the livers of both a pigeon and a duck. You've read the portions? I Yes, I have read the augers, and neither of them are positive for our futures. Um, but how are you, Stephen? Well, I'm I'm doing well, uh, significantly less well now that I hear that uh, the organs have have foretold our fates and that it is going to be grim. Uh, mm. The the it was a nihilistic and... liver, man. It was oh, it was dark. Geez, that, oh, that's no good. Yeah, the the cruel and cold uh, leaving behind of our our friends uh, sits heavy on my heart. But um, alas, mm-hmm. we will we will soldier on. We will soldier on to McIntyre chapter seven. Uh, but before we get there, uh, Stephen, what what are you drinking right now it's a good question well to warm the the cold caverns of uh, isolation from our companions uh i have my with me a lovely cup of black coffee i Mm. highly recommend it i truth be told forget anything about it i just know that i went downstairs coffee was on and i filled up my cup Hmm. so it was quite an unconscious gathering of the coffee is what i gather pretty much it was just kind of automatic i i was kind of thirsty knew i needed to drink uh to to get ready and also felt a little tired so going downstairs it was just a serendipitous moment of oh huzzah coffee Hmm. i mean to me it sounds like it was a little bit of a automatic motion like you weren't really in the moment you weren't really thinking about it and i think what you really need to tell yourself is that uh is that this is water i mean it's coffee but also (laughs) this is water Uh, i will look at my coffee cup and i will say this this is water Anywho, uh, speaking of Eskimos and water and Dave Foster Wallace, what what are you drinking uh, to combat the uh, ever ever encroaching race of solipsism? I don't know where the Eskimos came in, uh, but I'm drinking some lovely Evan Williams uh, Kentucky bourbon with uh, one ice cube in a fine crystal glass gifted to me by my wife's parents. I have a set of six. If anyone would like to join me so that more than one are in use at any given time that would be great oh, that sounds classy right there and the eskimo is for the record that uh that's one of the last things he says in this is water uh it's related to his uh his parable of the eskimos ah i'm not gonna try to out nerd you on david foster wallace trivia although that could be a, a special episode we could try and find Ooh. me and thomas could try and find facts about david foster wallace that you don't know and uh yeah Anyway. That could be kind of fun. Yeah, that no, I'd, I'd definitely be down for that. We could also just change the name to the David Foster Wallace fan cast or something. Please, please. I just, I, I, I want David Foster Wallace to look down from heaven or, you know, hopefully he's there and to look down from heaven and to see the David Foster Wallace fan club podcast and just smile upon us. Well, speaking of smiling upon things, uh, this week we smiled upon mcintyre chapter seven continuing from where we left off unsurprisingly in chapter six and uh steven i believe you had a little summary for us i do indeed uh so um chapter seven is entitled uh, quote unquote fact explanation and expertise uh so mcintyre devotes chapter seven to the idea of a fact saying that it is a quote in modern culture, a folk concept with an aristocratic ancestry, end quote. Exploring the failed notion that facts can be viewed purely objectively, that is to say, without some sort of framework through which to view them. Quote, it was an error to suppose that the observer can confront a fact face-to-face without any theoretical interpretation interposing itself, end quote. This is fairly well agreed upon by philosophers of science. In fact, I, I recall hearing the same during my own FISI class senior year. That's pretty textbook. Uh, He goes on to say, quote, what each observer takes himself or herself to perceive is identified and has to be identified by theory laden concepts, end quote. So in essence, we can't truly get to objectivity. We have to view facts through a lens, though presumably we can try to clear the lens as much as possible. He kind of concludes this concept with a quote, perceivers without concepts, as Kant almost said, are blind, end quote. 
Uh, McIntyre then makes the rather strong claim that, quote, if all our experiences were to be characterized exclusively in terms of this bare sensory type of description, a type of description which is it, which it is certainly useful for a var- variety of special purposes to resort to from time to time, we would be confronted with not only an uninterpreted, but an uninterpretable world, with not merely a world not yet comprehended by theory, but with a world that never could be comprehended by theory. His purpose in setting all of this up in the first page is to begin to poke at the origin of explanation and experience and their relationships to facts. He notes that, quote, the empiricist concept of experience was a cultural invention of the late 17th and 18th centuries, end quote, and, quote, it was intended as a device to close the gap between seems and is, between appearance and reality, end quote. In an unsurprisingly solipsistic twist, quote, it was to close this gap by making every experiencing subject a closed realm, a closed realm. There is to be nothing beyond my experience for me to compare my experience with so that the contrast between seems to me and is in fact can never be formulated, end quote. He discusses how empiricists actually had to co-opt words such as experience to be able to describe the bridge between these two notions, seems and is in fact. Quote, natural science teaches us to attend to some experiences rather than to others, and only to those when they seem to have been cast into the proper forms for scientific attention. It redraws the lines between seems and is. It creates new forms of distinction between both appearances and reality and illusion in reality, end quote. Confused on how this has one iota to do with ethics? If not, you're smarter than me, because I was lost until McIntyre explained that the significance of this is the shift from what was before viewed to be the proper mechanism for viewing the world, which was in terms of Aristotelian teleology, that, quote, Middle Ages mechanisms were efficient causes in a world to be comprehended ultimately in terms of final causes, end quote. The shift viewing of physical facts and experiences as explanations causes humanity to be viewed not by its final talos, quote, the explanation of actions is increasingly held to be the, be a matter of laying bare the physiological and physical mechanisms which underlie action, end quote. The matter, of course, only gets worse, as the science of under, human understanding went so far as to eliminate any sort of discussion around end goals from itself. Quine, a philosopher of science, argued that, quote, if it proved impossible to eliminate references to such items as beliefs and enjoyments and fears from our understanding of human behavior, that understanding could not take the form which Quine considers the form of human science, namely embodiment in law, law-like generalizations, end quote. Uh, that was quoting McIntyre for the record. Uh, McIntyre concludes that, quote, an Aristotelian account of what is involved in he- understanding human behavior involves an ineliminable reference to such items. And hence, it is not surprising that any attempt to understand human behavior in terms of mechanistic explanation must conflict with Aristotelianism. Uh, McIntyre then finishes up the chapter poking fun at the notion that government is often defended in terms of having more expertise, more resources, and a better scientific understanding of the human behavior, such that it can govern people far better than they could themselves. To that end, though, we'll have to wait until the much-anticipated chapter 8 to see him thoroughly dismantle the social sciences. Uh, So to wrap up, to sum up that summary, the idea of facts and explanations being able to kind of deconstruct humanity or or at the very least to render us uh, explainable by pure quote unquote scientific facts and to eliminate any sort of discussion around an end goal or a telos, just further distance us from our concept of ethics uh, as it was or the ethics as it should be. Um, and then he kind of does make some brief sketches around uh, uh, the things that were discussed in both chapter six and will be discussed in chapter eight. That's the tale I have to tell to you. Thank you for that. What I find really interesting with what McIntyre is doing here is just his attempt to sum up several hundred years of philosophy of science in two concepts. There's natural sciences, which is based on observations and is distrustful of personal experience as being a legitimate expression of what actually exists, which is why you need a vast conglomeration of experiences to you know test them over time and make sure that they work to explain concepts. And then and this whole realm as you pointed out, needs to have theories to mediate those observations. And the mistake of the Enlightenment was thinking that they were being empiricists when they could actually only ever be, and what they were doing was was natural science. Empiricism in the sense that experience is a closed realm that, you know, is not distinct from what is, 
and natural science are two incompatible theories, and they acted or thought they were doing both at the same time. It is an intriguing idea. The The idea of the closed realm was brought up several times, and I, I mentioned briefly that was very solipsistic. And one would think that that is just naturally hostile to any sort of endeavor to explore the world, which I suppose why is why, expo- or rather, experience was given as a bridge. Um, it, maybe the, the phrase of shared experiences or what have you. But even then, once you kind of accept that there is there is a distinct difference between what seems to be and what actually is, it, it would seem to follow that this is a very hostile thing towards what most people think of as the uh, natural sciences. Although, I mean, there are different frameworks out there for um, science to still exist under this, such as uh, the theories that we give are just simply the best explanations. They're not necessarily co- corresponding to reality. They're just the things that give the best explanatory power to what we observe, which for better or for worse, I, I think is not is half bad way of addressing that issue. Yeah. I, I mean, McIntyre is not picking a fight with natural sciences as such in any way. He thinks physics is fine, biology, all of that stuff doesn't really matter. The only part where it becomes problematic is where you're talking about humanity in here again, like you noted, is him turning Quine's argument on its head. Quine wants to do social science without intention and says that that's the only legitimate way of doing that. McIntyre says you can't remove intentions, purposes, and reasons for actions from talking about human behavior, so you will never have social science qua science. But to sort of pick up where, where you left off, he, he spends the last page, I think, setting up what he's going to do specifically in chapter eight. And he seems very intent on dissolving the supposed power and effectiveness, quote unquote, of modern bureaucracies. Um, and he loops all the way back to Weber's theory of bureaucracy and that a bureaucracy gains its power by appealing to its ability to be effective or efficient, which is taking means and putting them towards particular ends in the most cost-effective way. But he connects it with Quine's argument about social sciences and sort of science of human behavior, and that the appeal of the bureaucrat over time has been the ability to apply more and more social science, as it were, and become more and more technical and able to control and manipulate human events. And this is the justification for massive bureaucratic states for particular types of organizations and businesses. And he sketches out almost a whole theory of society from this conceptual argument around natural sciences, empiricism, and early social science um, that he sums up in a quote on page 86, a quote, so we can now see in bare skeletal outline a progress first from the enlightenment's ideal for a social science to the aspirations of social reformers. Next, from the aspirations of social reformers to the ideals of practice and justification of civil servants and managers. Then from the practices of managers to the theoretical codification of these practices and of the norms governing them by sociologists and organization theorists. And finally, from the employment of textbooks written by those theorists in schools of management and business schools to theoretically informed managerial practice of the contemporary technocratic expert. So he sees a historical development from Enlightenment folks trying to do their project to to social reformers. This would be the early progressives, 1920s, etc., you know, which brought us both good things and bad from programs to fight poverty, but also eugenics to the modern age and the technocratic experts that we have. Which I, I do like how this has all moved together nicely and he never forgets where he left off or the parts that he's already proven. So he, he's gone about mainly theoretically kind of dismantling a lot of the ethical structures that the Enlightenment has tried to set up um, and has done so by by kind of critiquing the, the progress, the, the projects of Hume and Kant and Kierkegaard. And also he never forgets the characters that he brought up in this chapter does seem to be that he's tying a bow around a few things and saying that Mm -hmm. the character of the bureaucratic manager, it relies on a lot of this, this sort of thing of facts. And then he brings up to where, where you were discussing uh, the fact that uh, government agencies, corporate bureaucracies and whatnot will use this idea of scientific facts applied to social sciences, which is the kind of ipso facto manifestation of a lot of the ethical systems that we've we've seen we've seen develop, and so this is all being very 
interestingly wrapped up together. I, I remember the first time reading through this, it, this kind of came out of nowhere. I didn't understand why he was going about this. Second time through, I, I'm understanding a little bit more clearly his project here. Uh, he's he's moving from the purely ethical discussion to this is how a lot of it's manifesting. And here I will show also how it is wrong. And in eight, he will go into painful detail on how even at the most practical level, this just simply does not work. So the ethics of the enlightenment or the logical end of the enlightenment project, ethical, well, the enlightenment ethical project, even at its most practical level, just doesn't work. Um, so I really like how he's he's kind of slowly progressing along and, and critiquing each individual part of it. One more quote, uh, quote, 20th century social life turns out in key parts to be the concrete and dramatic reenactment of 18th century philosophy, end quote. I mean, I'm, I'm reading this book for the first time, and he starts off with sort of abstract talking about ethics, where it's gone wrong. You know, we have emotivism as a specter. We have some stuff about managerial projects. We're not sure where that's going. But just with this latest rhetorical flourish, he's almost shifted the project of the book from being, we think ethics could be a change to a comprehensive condemnation of a good chunk of modern society. Because he would say that the ethical systems and the ethical justifications, the project that existed, is all bunk. And there's an entire society that's built itself after that. And I don't know if he has a solution um, from reviews of the book. My guess is he doesn't. <laughs> he does and he doesn't. Uh, the, the ending, he's quite ominous. Uh, I, I don't want to spoil the ending. No spoilers here. But he, he does take a rather grim notion. But I don't want to say he doesn't necessarily have a solution to it. Hmm. So I had some objections to his characterization. I am a English and poli sci <laughs> major, uh, so I have some social sciences, quote-unquote, in my background. I freely admit a huge number of problems in both fields that I have some small measure of expertise in, but at least from this, and granted, I still haven't met McIntyre's full salvo in Chapter 8, which, I'm, which is his full argument, but you can see in a way where he's going with some of this, and there are, I think, legitimate objections or or if they're objections at least maybe they are exceptions to the overall claims that McIntyre is making. One large part of the political science training that I've done has to do with economic development. And there's different levels of this you can go on the nation level of which there are numerous and contradictory theories much like there are numerous and contradictory theories in any field and you know various different prescriptions for success which we'll actually get into on my article of the day and I'm I'm sure rely on various degrees of effectiveness justification that McIntyre is not a fan of. But there's also very humble social science. Uh, a book called Poor Economics comes to mind. And it's very much about a natural science-esque approach to poverty alleviation because it's always contingent on place. It doesn't try and make grand theories except that you should use experimentation, rigorous evaluation, all for the intention of using always limited resources well. And you experiment with different angles and different strategies in order to help people or get them to voluntarily come in to get a, you know, an immunization shot or to add this health supplement or to put a mosquito net on. And there's all sorts of small hacks, let's say, a, a lot of which fall into the realm of behavioral economics. And that sort of is my my second criticism of this chapter is it has to do with, I guess, more modern stuff. So McIntyre is obviously writing in a particular time, and he's responding to the claims of particular people before him or contemporary of him. And he's absolutely correct that the field of economics, especially in the time period that he's writing and the period before 1920s, early social reformers, etc., were hugely overconfident of their abilities to manipulate behavior, to quantify things accurately, etc. And so all of his criticism of them is, is absolutely correct. But I guess I am not convinced that all of his criticisms hold to the present, that the sins of the Enlightenment mean that the project of allocating resources and having strategies to deal with particular problems as a large field and as, you know, the philosophy of, of doing so. I don't think it's it's doomed to failure for all eternity. McIntyre talks for a, a, a portion about how the social scientist who accepts a 
mechanistic view of human nature and stuff makes an exception for himself while he's doing his projects to manipulate people. I think that will always be true, like the benign autocrat that can develop a nation or, you know, various people in the U.S. who say, oh, if only I could be dictator of the United States for just a week. I would make everything so much better. It's like, no, you wouldn't. And you're a bad person for thinking that. Stop. But there are small things like having life insurance or health savings accounts be opt out instead of opt in. For example, things at the margins that you can do to make people's lives better that are the result of manipulation and in a sense, uh, one phrase that it's called is nudge economics. And it may be dehumanizing, it may not be, it's not in- entirely clear, but you can do things like improve or you can improve certain metrics to a degree. And I think there's a way that you could be humble about it that I don't feel like McIntyre takes into account. This was one thing that I recall, again, being being both somewhat confused and also a combination of mildly irritated and just kind of thinking he was a little bit out of his depth. And I, I think to an extent he is. Um, he is distinctly a philosopher. And so I I recall taking and I still continue to take his critiques on the sciences per, and his very, uh, very outspoken critiques on the social sciences. I, I would say it's certainly a understandable and I would say justifiable thing to take them with a grain of salt. Uh, he, in chapter eight, he will go into an, a more complex analysis of why he doesn't like this. But I think even then, he's a, he's a philosopher, so he had, does have some tools to be able to analyze different methods of thought and whatnot. But just because a system gets some wrong results doesn't mean the system itself is wrong or that we can't work on continuing to improve it. Um, also, to your point, I, I think you are very correct in that the there can be a certain benign manipulation i think it's a dangerous line to cross but or to at the very least walk but i think you are correct in that and he does kind of he 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 does kind of tread a dangerous line of kind of overstepping his philosophical bounds and going into critiquing the sciences uh in themselves rather than critiquing the method to which they're gone about um if it makes you feeling better i think it Economics, he, he does do some discussion around economics. I think his main axe to grind, though, is with the particular sciences that seek to explain human behavior as purely mechanistic. So while economics does do that somewhat, he really has an axe to grind with psychology and sociology. Um, that Those are the ones that he'll really kind of turn his guns to bear. He already did a little in seven and he really will in eight. Though I don't want to underemphasize the fact that he does he does attack economics and Partially justified, partially, I'm not sure how much justified. Well, I am I am always a fan of bashing sociology and psychology. That is never <laughs> something that I will not do. So say we all. I used to live in a house with a guy uh, who was a uh, psychology major, and anytime he would bring up anything, I'm like, so this has like a 30% chance of being true, right? Or replicable. <laughs> you know it's bad when you have less of a chance of being correct than a coin flip. It's true. That you are more um, likely to be wrong than right. The other thing that I would say just briefly in response to this is I can't actually totally believe that I was just defending behavioral economics and nudge economics as a field because I have deep moral qualms and suspicions about that field, but I just felt like they weren't getting a fair shake. And the other thing that I would say is even if everything that I said was true and that McIntyre isn't giving fair uh, shift to some very small, particular, humble and well-meaning actors who are very careful about what they do, the majority of the economics field or just, let's say, economic and political commentators have not taken McIntyre's lesson to heart whatsoever. So they have far more to learn from him than he has to learn from them in general. So just want to clarify that. Well, well, Nate, don't worry. Your defense will it will be between us and all of our many listeners. So you heard mm-hmm. it, listeners. Make sure to tweet in Facebook and uh, socially ostracize Brevin for this defense. Yeah. I was going to say, I felt almost kind of heated during that. I should just make that into my rant. Um, but I actually have a a decent one that I that I wrote out, so I'll I'll save my actual rant for later. Put that in the pocket and make sure to pull it out later. Uh, speaking of uh, putting things in your pocket, uh, I think it's time to move on to articles. Um, unless Stephen, you have any more pressing things you want to talk about? I don't think so. I uh, tune in next week for uh, chapter eight and chapter Empire eight. Will crucify uh, social sciences. It's going to be all sorts of good. The vaunted chapter eight. We- We'll need to do Looking something special. It. It's been a while. Um, yeah. Oh, man. What could we do? Like role play, 
just sound effects everywhere. I, I don't I know. I think but so. You, get the KO button ready. You might want to warm that thing up. I'll get the KO button ready. Um, damn. All right. We'll figure this out. But in the meantime, uh, Stephen, I believe you had a uh, fascinating and utterly depressing, as is normal, article for us. You know me. I w- I'll, I'll rarely bring up an article that isn't absolutely depressing. Um, man, that's a that's a sad shit to to have. I need to I need to work on that. Uh, but yes, I do have an article, uh, and it's an opinion article in New York Times by one David Brooks. Uh, it's called "The Cruelty of Callout Culture." Uh, in it, he discusses a woman named Emily, who is a rising star in the punk rock music in or the punk rock music genre uh, in Vir- the Virginia area. Uh, so apparently, during a gig, there was an accusation against one of her band members and apparently a very close friend of hers. Uh, the allegation was concerning unwelcome, sexually explicit photographs. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, she publicly denounced him, kicked him out of the band, and watched his life, for better or for worse, spiral as the issue became public. Again, and I, I really do mean that for better or for worse. It, it kind of just depends on the situation. Um, she uh, she later experienced the other side of it, though. Um, so apparently when she was in high school, a, uh, a classmate had a new f- nude photo published. And she belittled the girl through some uh, kind of ill-spirited uh, emoji or what have you. Uh, so this was found out, um, you know, at, at kind of the current time that this was written or that she was being interviewed. And she, too, was crucified in the court of public opinion. Uh, she lost her band, her friends, her future, kind of everything. The, the strange thing is, even as her life was kind of spiraling before her eyes, uh, she accepted this as just, uh, saying that she deserved this. She was sorry. She felt like a monster. Et cetera, et cetera. In essence, she she said something to the effect of, "If I'm getting called out, I clearly deserve it." And my my interest in this, my discussion on this, isn't so much of whether or not this was justified. I mean, clearly, posting cruel comments on some poor girl's photo that was wrongly made public is morally wrong. I don't think anyone would say otherwise. And also, clearly, sending unwarranted, sexually inappropriate photographs is also wrong. But there's something very creepy about the calling out process itself, opines Brooks, and I'm inclined to agree. He talks about the man who first called Emily out, quoting him as describing the rush of pleasure of calling her out as almost orgasmic, uh, expressing zero regrets over ruining her life, saying she deserved it, he didn't care whether she lived or died. Very guttural, very visceral, like he, he enjoyed it the fact that her life was now ruined. And in in my opinion, this is creepy on two points. Uh, First, the court of public opinion does not have all the facts and seemingly doesn't even want them. See, for instance, this last week on uh, the one kid at the pro-life protests and the fact that facts are still coming in, people are still opining and wanting to either crucify or fully exonerate or what have you. And yet it is content ruining someone even though it may be mistaken. Now, but this is only of practical import. The real terrifying notion is the degrading of empathy. Brooks points out the quite frightening similarities between now and various real life dystopias. Quote, so all sorts of historical alarm bells were going off, the way students denounced and effectively murdered their elders for incorrect thought during Mao's cultural revolution and in Stalin's Russia. And the fact that kind of similar to that, now people are just delighting and calling out people that they very well once once have admired. He, He goes on to sketch how civility is cultivated or killed. Quote, do we really think that cycles of cruelty do more to advance civilization than cycles of wisdom and empathy? I'd say civilization moves forward when we embrace rule of law, not when we abandon it. I'd say we no longer gather in coliseums to watch people get eaten by lions because clergy members, philosophers, and artists have made us less tolerant of cruelty, not more tolerant. And he leaves off with a rather chilling warning. Even the quest of justice can turn into barbarism if it is not infused with the quality of mercy, an awareness of human frailty, and a path to redemption. The crust of civilization is thinner than you think. And so I think this is a really good reminder because part of me, I, I, I do understand kind of the, the idea of the, the rush you get when you find out that somebody who has been caught in their ill deeds is publicly crucified. I mean, the idea of, you know, a politician who has sexually harassed their uh, their secretaries or the members of their uh, campaign committee or what have you, finally given justice and finally their career is is just in the, in the shreds. There is something very satisfying about that, but there is something very disturbing about our eagerness to go about that enterprise without any mercy, without any understanding, and the fact that we're kind of very quickly on the path to, we we want to eat our own, we want to see people get publicly crucified, and there's something very, very visceral about that, that I, I think Brooks is right to worry about. It's almost as if there's a uh, coliseum of schadenfreude. There, there really is, and it's it's quite a weird thing. I guess uh, human history it really does kind of repeat itself, just in different ways. 
I'm somewhat distanced from things like this, thankfully, because I'm not on Twitter fairly rarely on Facebook in the sense that I, I never post anything. I only read things. But one podcast I was listening to was commenting on a couple of the most recent controversies and saying, you know, is it possible that people will learn their lesson and maybe, you know, moderate themselves on Twitter? It's like, uh, no, they won't. But all the reasonable people will get off of Twitter. Then it will become even more unreasonable. And the other angle to that, though, is, for example, with this controversy with the Covington Catholic kids, is that the original Twitter account that made the post was a bot. It wasn't a person. No, no. It, it was a account from Brazil masquerading as an account from California. So one one side thought is that it, I mean, that edited the video in a specific way, made it provocative, you know, put the original wording in, which then was picked up by the New York Times, Washington Post, etc. So uh, as it turns out, our society is incredibly, uh, and we live in a society as a side note, uh, but our society is incredibly susceptible to bots that can literally dominate the entire political, social conversation for days on end and bring out the worst in everyone. And that's something to be concerned of in itself. Right. Yeah, we, we do live in a society. I, I'm grateful that you pointed that mm. out. Mm -hmm. Yep. It, it, the, I guess the ironic thing is this is two years after we've been suspicious of the fact that our election may have been hacked via these methods, via Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. And the one thing that kind of our generation, the younger generation has been saying is, oh my gosh, how much smarter are we than our parents' generation that they clearly got misled by a bunch of deceiving you know, uh, hacker farms and whatnot. And then we get hit with stuff like this. And I have friends who are allegedly very, uh, social, very social media savvy and fell for this just as quick. I, I started falling from it. I'm very uh, falling for it. I, I'm very grateful that I didn't post anything, but I remember seeing it and being, and thinking, Oh my goodness, mm -hmm. you know, this, this punk kid is, you know, doing who knows what. And then kind of trying to get myself to take a step back and think, okay, not all the facts have been gathered. I don't see that he's saying anything. He looks more nervous than smirking. Maybe there's more to the story. And of course there was. The side of empathy though, there's the lack of it, I think is more and more evident to call back to Sam's favorite thing to talk about is the cults. And the you have zero sympathy for anyone who's not on your team, who's not in your cult. I have a friend who's in a grad program and they were... Uh, talking to one of their friends who used to teach students in like rural Florida or something. It's like high school teachers, like, you know, kids are 15, 16. And this person was a English teacher and the students that they taught, you know, sometimes wrote racist, sexist, homophobic essays in the course of fulfilling class assignments. And my friend commented that, oh, well, it's too bad that they that those students probably didn't have a chance to learn other opinions or, you know, sort of be cured in one way or another of their unfortunate thoughts because they probably grew up in families where that was the norm and they just never had a chance. And, and now if they go out into the world without anyone to help them, es essentially they'll be called out on it. And then likely as not, they'll double down because when you're, when you're attacked, you know, fight or flight, half the people are going to fight. But the former teacher basically responded that they deserved that, that they had no sympathy for them, that they were bad people for thinking you have bad opinions and you should feel bad. And that's not in any way to say anything about their opinions is are defensible, but just that I think Brooks is right, that there's a critical lack of empathy on all levels and across numerous populations. You're, you're spot on with uh, the Colts. Uh, he, Brooks even went so far, I don't think he ever went out with Colts, but he did say that this promotes a very tribalistic us versus them you're either in or you're out and that's tertiary too. kind of the more uh radical cults that very much do go the you're in your or you're out think westboro baptist with the you know everyone else but us is going to hell and they deserve it and we should rejoice over this because they're evil there is something very sad about this delighting in well you deserve whatever comes to you because you had bad thoughts um and there is something very kind of quasi fundamentalist religion about that which is is just kind of quite sad um well you know what else is sad is my article of the week which is uh the retreat of african democracy in foreign affairs magazine and it's behind a paywall so that sucks but the uh short summary of this is that there's a negative trend of democratic governance in africa which is an area of which I have some particular concern having lived there and studied it and hope to make a career of it someday. Um, I actually did my 
undergraduate thesis on economic integration in sub-Saharan Africa. But in the 1990s, there was a positive trend with countries like Benin, Zambia, Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, all having their first democratic elections post the end of colonization, South Africa ending apartheid. And there was a huge movement to where at one point, all peaceful nations in Africa, so all states that were not in the midst of some kind of a civil war, had a degree, had a election to one degree or another. Most of them, you know, rigged at least a little bit, but that's normal. Um, However, in the last several years, we've seen marked downward blip, and hopefully it's just a blip. Tanzania and Zambia have both seen authoritarian actions taken by their presidents to stay in power. In the DRC, which I've been following, there's been a lot of brouhaha, and basically the situation has ended up where the outgoing president who's reached his term limit has installed the opposition leader as the president, but rigged all of the other legislative elections so that he he still has control over the legislator, and now he's just going to kind of roll from the shadows and the opposition president won't be able to do anything. It's actually kind of hilarious if it wasn't terrible and many people's lives were at stake here. But on top of this, there's all sorts of struggles with China's growing investment and attempts at establishing control. China established its first outside of China military base in Africa or is working on that, which is concerning for U.S. hegemony, etc., And in addition, it also creates a problem because the United States and Europe, when they do infrastructure and aid projects, they can often put attachments and uh, requirements such as you can't torture people, you can't have a secret police. But when China does this, human rights is not a part of their public platform that they're particularly concerned about. So they don't have those requirements. Um, So that creates, you know, basically there are, there are no incentives to be good actors. And there's all sorts of other problems such as uh, issues with term limits, not being respected and presidents modifying the constitution of their countries. Uganda is one example where I've lived. Uh, The president, Yoweri Museveni is the guy who won the last civil war and has since governed as unelected president. But every time he hits the term limit, he gives himself an extension. And the article says that since 2000, 30 presidents in Africa have attempted to to change the constitution to extend their term limits, and 18 have succeeded. And for context, there's only 54 nations in Africa. So more than half have tried, and most of those have succeeded. And what the article concludes is that rule of law is down, political freedom is down, which of course links, links to economic freedom predictability, human rights, the ability for other countries to invest. And there's not rule of law, but instead rule by law, where if you change the rules of the government to give you more power instead of flagrantly violating them, you technically can sort of delay the international reaction because you haven't broken any laws and you're not going against your constitution. You just keep changing it to so, so that you can do whatever you want. And so there's delayed reactions in terms of international sanctions and stuff. Uh, there's problems with oil. There's the idea of the development autocrat which we've talked about sort of briefly, you know, if only I could be dictator for a day and make everything better. And yeah, it's it's depressing. And there's not a clear solution for this, especially with U.S. policy being turning more isolationist and, you know, rightly turning towards China and Russia as international foes in various spheres, but without international attention, focus, and positive reinforcement for good behavior in, in Africa. Um, it's not likely to get better anytime soon. That, that really is unfortunate. I mean, Kind of the, the hope I'm assuming in the, the 90s was that Africa could kind of, you know, it had been devastated so much in the, in the past few hundred years. It was finally on the road to recovery, finally on the road to joining as, you know, a very respected continent and full of respected countries. And then to, to kind of hope, well, hopefully it's just a blip, but to, to take a step back is, is quite sad. Certainly. I, I have a friend who uh, lives in Uganda as well. And he was telling me about some of the elections and how, uh, they do get a little shady in that uh, most of the time the uh, opponents, uh, after after they lose and the ostensibly rigged elections, are arrested for treason and, and such. Such is the life of an African opposition leader. Certainly. Well, I suppose everything uh, everything decays into the entropy, which which brings me to uh, to my rants in that I I look around at my at my room and it is cluttery, it is messy, and it brings me to mind just the idea that kind of everything. You know the the struggle to keep things in order to fight against chaos is ever going, and the moment you stop fighting against it, the next thing you know, your laundry basket is overflowing, and you haven't folded anything, and your bed is unmade, and whatnot. 
So uh, it, it more, not, not necessarily a, a negative rant or whatever, but it is a good reminder that kind of chaos is always out there and entropy is uh, ever increasing and to, uh, to fight against it is a noble yet losing battle. And to both encourage uh, our listeners to fight against the entropy, but also to remind them it's, it's going to win. It's, it's really going to win. Your messy room is just one symptom of it. Every time you wake up and there are displaced items in your room, it is the subtle and small reminder of a dark, chaotic universe that all the order and good that you have built up will one day return to darkness. Memento Mori, everyone. Memento Mori. Memento Mori. For my rant, I also have something that is eternally frustrating. Uh, and my rant this week is about leaky Tupperware. So, in the olden days, we made wineskins and baskets. And then when glass jars were invented, and after that, tin cans... These were all wondrous items that markedly improved the lives of the human race. They had their downsides, but we could live with them. They had a purpose, and if we treated them right, they would fulfill it. And then Tupperware broke upon the bow of society, and it promised a new age, lightweight, resealable, nearly unbreakable. No more would we worry about glass shards or ragged tin edges. It was a glorious promise akin to God's own rainbow. And we believed Tupperware, fools that we were. (laughs) Now we live in an age wash with curry drippings and splashes of soup. Much like humanity, Tupperware had a purpose, a telos, but has fallen crushingly short. Stained shirts, soiled hands, and filthy backpacks have been its foul and evil harvest. And for its sins, I, alongside all people of goodwill, uh, now curse, cast away, and proffer malediction for leaky Tupperware in whatever deep cupboards it might lurk. May it suffer the flames of eternal hellfire and be consigned to, to the landfill of history. I had a bad day at work. It was curry. Man, that's that's strong rhetoric. It must have been one one awful curry spill. Sweet mercy. My poor backpack has suffered so much abuse. Soy sauce, soy sauce, and curry have been the two biggest things. You would think that I would learn and put it into like a plastic bag around the Tupperware, but I don't learn, um, and I choose to blame this entirely on the Tupperware. So, understandably so. I, I like how that started out sounding like a commercial, but then quickly went negative and turned into an anti-commercial. That, that I appreciate that very much. I'm not gonna lie. I spent several minutes searching for like specific ancient curses and curses in Hindi and stuff, so that I could do it against leaky Tupperware. Um, but it's hard to find. It kept just finding swear words, and I. I I don't want swear words. I want maledictions. I want to, you know, cast the devil and his angels against these guys, but it's just not working. Homework that you put into that. And I I actually very much agree with your opinion there. I recently read an article, well, a few weeks ago, read an article about um, some family that was trying to go completely plastic free and obviously very okay. difficult process. Went up. I didn't realize how difficult it was until I just decided one day to kind of count up how many times I even enc- I encounter plastic or I use plastic and to at least think of a way that I could get around it. I couldn't. Sweet mercy, I ran into so many plastic things, and Tupperware is one of the number ones. Good God, dude, we, we use it all the time, and there's no escape. How did it infect our lives so? It's a petroleum-based cancerous wound on the face of society, which we live in. Dude, we live in a society. Well, with that all taken care of, all I can say is um, I'm looking forward to Chapter 8. I have nobody remarks. Zero. I, I, I'm about it. Yeah. Look forward to chapter eight. Lots of uh, crit- criticizing the social sciences. It's going to be a rip roaring good time. Yeah. I actually really enjoy McIntyre um, switching over from hating on ethics and just saying, you know what? Bureaucracy is a problem. It's like, damn, thank you. It's he a- does a very good job at concisely breaking down exactly why X, Y, and Z are an issue. Um, argues very well very cogently and he, he's honestly for a philosopher he's fun to read he is yeah he's he's one of those writers that writes so confidently he's just fun to read like well to be fair like the first sentence of chapter seven i just want to read again um i i read it and my wife just burst out laughing and was like that is the most pretentious way that you could say that fact is in modern culture a folk concept with an aristocratic ancestry and she was like that means nothing that is bullshit he's just saying that because it sounds cool (laughs) i could honestly see that being very much the case and he does get in trouble i think in this chapter particularly with a lot of naturalist fallacy the you know the idea of well i just pointed out where it was invented 
therefore it's false. It's like, no, you just pointed out a historical note of interest that yes, this concept came around at that time. You have said nothing about its truth value, which in some cases he goes on to discuss it, it, the, the validity, but in some cases he just acts like, oh yeah, therefore it's not good. Well, uh, that's all very well and good. I'm, I, I'm glad that we solved all of the problems and there's nothing more to discuss. And this podcast is, uh, is uh, now over. There's nothing more to talk about. Really, we can't wrap up now. I, I think we can We can actually probably contact McIntyre and just say, hey, you could have left off at Chapter 7. We figured out everything already. No, I, I, I yes, sarcastically for the point of it, but I, I am desperate to read Chapter 8. I'm so excited. Um, oh, it's going to be fun stuff. Okay. Well, so that we can get to that, uh, for the problem with reading podcast, uh, I'm Brevin. I'm Steven. And we will see you next time. Adios. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. the unofficial ending that i've decided now is is you saying adios or see you next time and then me going, going i like it